All right. So, Rococo. So the um, the term Rococo, like Baroque, was applied as a derisive term. It's uh, very much. Uh, it's you know if um, Baroque is over the top, Rococo is even more so. It's really it's almost like they had to try to figure out where we go from elaborate. Um, you know, they really just started to pile on the elaborate. Um, it's a little different. Um, now, Louis the Fifteenth is the French monarch who is um, associated. He's a, so his reign is associated with the Rococo. It's really you could call it late Baroque. Um, really, from like about 1730 to 1760. And Louis the Fifteenth is considered to have squandered the success and wealth of Louis the Fourteenth. Um, kind of like he increased the stratification of French society and made it a lot harder for Louis the Sixteenth uh, because you know the uh, it, the excess of the wealthy led was one of the many factors leading to the that led to the French Revolution and. Louis the Sixteenth paid with his life, so uh, that was sort of famously beheaded um, at the guillotine. But Louis the Fifteenth, he's earlier. He's he's he did he did not suffer that fate. But so Rococo, uh, there are certain symbols that were sort of added on to the uh, to the Baroque uh, to make it Rococo. Rocks, shells, grotto, very earthy stuff is added, is like, you know, is, um, you know, that's their features of this late Baroque. There's Louis the 15th. And he is the great grandson of Louis the 14th. So here, um, here they are in their wigs and finery. I love the red heels. Um, and so here's Louis. So he has his, his, uh, son and grandson who Louis the 14th lived a very long time. And so rather than wait around, he appointed his son and grandson to other positions, uh, like other, other, um, king, you know, other kingdoms. And so his great grandson was Louis the 15th. There he is in splendor. Uh, Fleur de Lis, which is a symbol of the French French government. Really just symbol a symbol of France is the Fleur de Lis. Um, nice legs, right? All right, so this is a, a painting by uh, Francois Boucher. Um, so um, here you see this like Japan, or it's called a Japan tea table. It's black and red. Now, some people would live in um, smaller apartments and some of the other larger, like the larger areas of their home might be preserved as more as show places. And they wouldn't actually live in them because then they wouldn't mess them up. For when people came by. Now that, so we want to get to the the interior here, where you see the uh, the ornament really starts to um, obscure architectural. Elements and so, like the difference between the walls and the ceiling, this kind of disappears. Where it's really like part of the um, excess of this uh, period, similar to Baroque. And here are some engravings 
of different styles of molding for chimneys. I guess uh, I guess so like a fireplace and fire and it's surround. Mirror making getting larger and larger. So they still had all the workshops running in the in the late Baroque period. There, console table. Now you can see in the um, in the Baroque, you could expect something a little bit more symmetrical, which is that upper left Louis the Fourteenth. The Rococo console, console, we can see it's only two legs on the floor, and the back is connected to the wall. And you can see up above, you can see the bottom of the mirror frame. But you can see if you go like split down the center, it's not symmetrical. This idea of this sort of like rolling movement that just seems to keep on going from one piece to the to the next. It really just seems to flow together. There's definitely that same sense of movement in the Baroque, but the Baroque is still even, it's almost like it's um, a little bit more, um, if you could, it's not really reserved. It's just like the symmetry is a little bit more static, meaning it's not moving. Uh, this is another one. So symmetrical, you can see a console table can have four legs, but there's just so much ornament and very organic and yet very stylized and artificial all at the same time. You can see here in this uh, cartouche, this shell shape, and three different fleur, three fleur de lis in it. Um, I did want to mention uh, you're reading the Abrams Guide. After Louis the Fourteenth is a section on William and Mary, which is English Baroque. And if you, when you read the section on Louis the Fifteenth, and then Queen Anne. Queen Anne is kind of like a English version of the Rococo. And both the, in England, they were much more reserved than the French. The French were just a little out of control. The uh, English have always had been a little bit less, maybe a little bit less expressive compared to the French. Now this, this right here is a very good example of uh, something from the Rococo era, uh, very organic, um, sort of symmetrical, but not, you know, definitely like not. And it really looks like it's just been twisted. This is like uh, one of the, so um, Alina, you mentioned the, uh, you know, like disliking, like if you don't like Baroque, wait till you see Rococo. Yeah. I started to like Rococo because it is much, freer in a way and it's not it's almost like you can see it looks like somebody just twisted that by hand oh. there is an engraving of it this uh Maisonnier, uh silverware and table setting and there is the uh soup terrain which is the container for soup for serving soup now look at that thing Looks like there is a uh, crayfish crawling on top of it, leaves um, a way, kind of a splash of a wave at the bottom. Um, the whole thing looks like it's just this organic object. Now here, photograph of a breaking wave. Hmm, kind of similar. Um, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Similar kind of, uh, sort of like this static form in motion. 
here, I, you know, I like, I really like this, uh, cause I, I, I kind of, you know, um, I don't completely get it, but I like it. Um, so here you have a, uh, broth bowl made of soft paste porcelain. Um, but look at the ornament. I'll get into the soft like porcelain in a second. Uh, I don't know, like rocks, mud, fish just kind of slap down on the surface. Um, odd choice. There's a great big shell around it. Um, um, I'm, it's fascinating to me because in a way it's just a little like, it's like really like a crayfish or a sturgeon just kind of like sitting there. Um, it's kind of a little, it's a, it's a little weird and I like it and I really like the way it's, um, um, I don't know. It's like, it's a little, it's quirky now here. And like the handle of this is really looks very like just, you know, it is organic and, you know, not, it's a little bit, a little bit random. You know, it really looks like you can see somebody made it. Now here, um, a commode in chinoiserie style. So the commode is like a low cabinet. And uh, now commode, I remember my stepfather used to always refer to like the toilet as the commode. And there's a reason for that. They didn't have, you know, you, if you didn't have like indoor plumbing and a, uh, you know, bathroom as we have it with, you know, um, modern drainage um you might use something like a chamber pot and rather than you know emptying it all the time you might leave it in the commode so it would be like leave the stinky bucket <laughs> in the commode and that's just where you know that's that's the association um now here you can see this this um it looks like a combination of painting, marquetry, and then you've got this like uh, sculptural uh, work pasted on. Um, but uh, you know, this is something where it's it's meant to it's meant to look Asian, but it is a you know it's a European style of furniture. So it has this like this stuff that Ormolu, which is the um, this like gilded ornament, which is really like, you know, cheaper. It's a, it's a cheaper metal than gold and it's fired in a kiln with mercury to make it look gold. Uh, there is another, uh, Louis the 15th commode. Dragons. Mm -hmm. uh this is uh this, so this is something a little different this is from venice oops go back here so walnut so the uh, scrivania are these like little plaques um bronze mod decorative panels 42 colored engravings on silk ground silk ground under glass yeah. So I guess this is like Venetian Rococo. Still, it's it's very, you know, very interesting uh, to me. There's like this choice with all these like these little decorative panels that almost seem like this, like, kind of like the woods peeled away with this little golden frame around it. Um, pretty beautiful. Very, like a lot going on there. All right, now here is a Louis XV roll top desk. So this had this is like marquetry on this surface, marquetry all over these surfaces. Uh, so as a, as you saw last week with that video, that is where it is like cut pieces that are glued that are all like you know um, glued to a surface, and then that is attached to the piece of furniture. 
for the roll top, each of these sections would have to be done independently, or else they would like do the whole thing and cut them because there's you know they can't. It's got to, these all have to like move right on that seam. All right, so there is a uh, Louis the Fourteenth fauteuil, which is the armchair with the you know, area open under the arm. Um, and there's a type of uh, upholstered armchair called a bergere, where that section between the arm and the seat is 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 like you know it's a solid piece. So there is a Louis the Fifteenth, Louis the Fourteenth. So you start to get furniture that is named for these monarchs, and it is uh, expresses a different style. Uh, a royal fauteuil. Look at that beautiful upholstery. I want that thing. And this one too. So uh, someone do, could someone do me a favor and look up the term damask, D-A-M-A-S-K? And then when you find it, tell us. You can let me know, and you can tell us what Damask is. Oh, and there's Greta Garbo, in case you didn't know. She was filming. I found it. Who was that? Uh, it's Hope. Good. All right, so Hope, why don't you tell us, tell us what Damask is? So the definition I found for damask is a figured woven fabric with a pattern visible on both sides, typically used for table linen and upholstery. All right, thank you. So yeah, so it's a woven, a woven fabric that's used for upholstery that has a visible pattern on, on both sides. And I say that because you're going to you're going to see that term um, because they use damask on some of this um, uh, on some of this furniture. So basically, it's a reversible fabric. So here's a um, Louis the Fifteenth loyant or folding stool with these uh, nice little tassels. There is a lit de repose or a chaise lounge. So it's really like, you know, this very beautiful, actually very, quite nice. It's almost like it wraps around you. Um, looks great. My cats would love it. So this, um, combination of what really is like an armchair and a really long ottoman. Uh, this style, so here, this is the bergere style, where you can see uh, underneath the arms just is solid, and so you don't have that opening, which is a feature of the fauteuil. So, which is the sides what the cheeks means, canapé à jouer. It's a sofa. We get sofas now. So now we have proper sofas in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, this is a, a cane sofa. So this is the um, caning, this backing right here. Sofa with an interesting back. Nice upholstery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, so soft paste porcelain. When you see um, soft paste porcelain, 
which is contrast which contrasts with hard paste porcelain. I mentioned um, Chinese um, decorative work. Porcelain is from China, and the Chinese developed a way of making it that is very hard and um, also um, heat. I guess it's like um, almost like it's like insulate. It's sort of like um, it holds heat well. The reason why like a a teapot and a and teacups are made from porcelain is that they don't they tend not to get as hot when because they they distribute or they like you know they they sort of like insulate from heat well hard paste porcelain is um it it's fired at a higher temperature the europeans couldn't figure out how to do it and so they made this um variation of it using like clay and ground glass but they had to fire it at a lower temperature meaning it was more brittle and more prone to breaking so soft paste porcelain is the european imitation of chinese porcelain and the fun you know so like maybe ironic is that because the soft paste porcelain was more prone to breaking it tends to be more rare from this era because there's less of it around because a lot of it broke. So this, um, you know, this choice is very, or so organic is something that you can write down as an association with the Rococo. Cause it looks, the handle looks just like a, it is a vine or a branch. And there are these little, uh, you know, the flowers and the um, and uh, stem just sort of wound around it. And this, I love this weird stretched out little thing. This looks like it was just like distorted uh, when it was made. It's almost like the top was just kind of like stretched up while it was soft. Uh, that's not how it was made, but it looks kind of like that. Very circusy in some respects, it's like, at least to my to my uh, to my mind. And this company up here, uh, Sev, was a workshop that produced uh, porcelain, similar to Gobelin and Savonnerie producing uh, tapestries and carpets. Sev is known for its um, pottery. And these, um, I love the colors. And the animal figure is beautiful stuff. Okay, now here, um, the last bit here, um, this is in Munich, which is southern present-day Germany. Um, and this guy, Francois, whoop, let's go back here. Francois Civilly, he was um, French, Belgian. Belgium wasn't a country then, so I guess he would have been Flemish maybe. But um, <clears throat> he took this French Rococo style and he, uh, he was employed by some of the German kings. And so he produced this, you know, like um, the, a lot of the mon other like kings and monarchs around Europe, when Louis XIV built Versailles, they all wanted their own Versailles. And so a lot of them created these palaces trying to, you know, either imitate Versailles, rival Versailles. So you can see this is very much, you know, it's in, a, in some respects, it's like Versailles. You can see the, there's, this is more symmetrical. This is more organic. And just, it's a lot of stuff. And I really like the uh, that the ceiling becomes the sky, with birds flying in it, plants growing up, little trees growing up. Uh, again, um, 
still, you know, the little Amorini or little cherubs hanging out up there. Mm -hmm. Goddesses. And so it really obscures the difference between the, you know, the architecture, the ornament really just obscures the differences, like just like, like the, you know, the different areas of the architecture, because, <clears throat> excuse me, it all just kind of grows into one. Mm -hmm. And there we have the Rococo. I think you're, um, yeah, some of this like, um, let's go back to our, this guy. That is, so I want you to look, you know, look again at this one, the asymmetry of it is very important in being able to identify that as Rococo or late Baroque, as opposed to the, the Baroque of Louis XIV. And they wouldn't have done something asymmetr asymmetrical like this in the early part of the Baroque era. This is almost like they were trying to make their own version of it. And they were just kind of like, making it, uh, they were kind of doing it wrong on purpose in some respects because, you know, they're ignoring this, like, you know, the traditional hierarchy and symmetry that was associated with Louis the Fourteenth, And they're just, you know, coming up with their own version, this very organic and um, really freeform Baroque. Okay, um, I will put up another uh, vocabulary list um, of terms. You're not going to have another um, discussion board vocabulary assignment until after the midterm. So, um, does any now uh, does anyone have any questions about the the latest quiz or vocabulary that you're doing? Oh, the one about um, uh, Romanesque, Gothic, and uh, Renaissance? Yes. Okay, no. So, at, um, let me know if you do have questions. I'm going to uh, have uh, just a few more of the second vocabulary to grade, or the first vocabulary to grade. Um, and then I will get on to evaluate assessing giving you assessments for uh the second quiz and the second vocab um okay well i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop the